Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 24th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss where the legislature is on the budget and the issues ahead in resolving it. Second, we discuss what we think it's going to take to pass SJR 6, the governor's proposed PFD-related constitutional amendment. And third, we focus one last time on why we think it's important for Alaskans to watch unrepresented the award-winning documentary on the corrupting influence of money in politics, and the related Alaska-focused panel discussion that follows. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, Let's dive into it here. We've got the special session, and I will say, look, I immediately saw some of the commentary and I could see what kind of uphill battle we're going to facing, uh, you know, Senator Stedman saying, well, 50, 50 just doesn't work. And Foster making notes about how the reverse sweep is they're holding their breath to see what's going to happen. You could see exactly what's going on here. And some of the folks seem to be playing directly into the business as usual crowds hands by wanting to rush through this whole process and uh, not even deal with a permanent fund until August um, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about a little bit about what's going on with the budgets, the conference committees, and what you see happening right now. Well, on the budget, um, uh, it's all about getting the 21 plus 11 plus enough agreement on the reverse sweep. And it's just, it's just picking through the options, uh, and, and building support for whatever option gets that 20 plus 21 plus 11 plus enough uh, for uh, for the reverse sweep, and there's really there, there's there's two big options on the table uh, for how to do that. One, they're both kick the can options. One is a combination of PFD cuts plus the CBR um, to uh, to get to the uh, to get to you know agreement, and and it, this all relates to the PFD, of course. And, and, and the components are the, the, if you just use, if you use PFD cuts to balance the budget, you don't bring into the CPR, uh, the CBR, and you don't bring in the ERA. If you just use uh, PFD cuts to balance the budget, the leftover PD, PFD is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 per PFD. That's prop that's, that's option one. Right. Option, option two is if you if you bring in the CBR and you use the CBR to um, help uh, help balance the budget or help support the PFD, you probably get to a thousand dollars, maybe a thirteen hundred dollar uh, PFD. But you're draining you're essentially draining the CBR. You you you've totally tapped out uh, uh, any remaining uh, leftover savings uh, at that point. So that's a thirteen hundred dollar PFD. And then if you and, and then if you if you kick in the ERA, if you take a portion of the ERA as the governor's proposed, or as, as, and as also the Senate proposed in their, in, in their vote uh, on the last evening of the session, uh, you could get to a $2,300 PFD, but you're, but you're taking a portion of the ERA at that point. Right. So it's a question of what, what, what is it going to take to get to 21 plus 11 plus enough to, to, to do the reverse sweep? And, you know, the, some would like to just cut it off, say the PFD is going to, this is Natasha, 
say we're just going to do the PFD. We're just going to you know do a leftover PFD. That's it. That's five hundred dollars. Can they get to twenty one plus eleven plus enough for the reverse sweep to do that? The sec the, the second is the CB bring in the CBR that we're going to drain the CBR to help you know pay a PFD and and that is that gets you to thirteen hundred dollars. Say that gets you to thirteen hundred dollars. And then the question is, will that get you 21 plus 11 plus enough to, to do the reverse sweep? And then the third is, do you have to drag in to, to get to 21 plus 11 plus reverse sweep? You have to drag in the ERA and how much of the ERA do you have to drag in? There's going to be a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance to dragging in uh, the ERA. But is that necessary to get you to 21 plus 11 plus the reverse sweep? Um, and, and and it's just it's a it's a numbers game. I mean, all of this is going to be around just trying to figure out what it's going to take to get you to 21 plus 11 plus reverse sweep. There's one uh, there's there's one component of this that is could be jettisoned. That is the reverse sweep. It could be that that what they finally agree to is whatever gets them to 21 plus 11. And they won't do the reverse sweep, and so you know Lyman's nightmare. So the the PCE funds are going to come back into the CBR, right? Um, and that's a possibility. Well, and I think I think we should break down, Brad, because I think you and I throw a lot of things around here that you and I kind of fundamentally understand, but maybe the listeners don't. Could you describe the reverse sweep for folks real quick so that they understand when we keep talking about the reverse sweep and why it's such a monumental thing in this process? What exactly it is? Sure. So there are any more. There are really two pots of money that are out in designated, not dedicated, but designated funds. Uh, one is the uh, Alaska Higher Education uh, College Fund. That's the the earnings from the earnings from which are it's invested, and the earnings from which are used to fund uh, college scholarships, a program that uh, Senator uh, Governor Parnell uh, started. Um, and then the other is the PCE, the Power Cost Equalization Fund. And there's a pot of money, about a billion dollars, that sits in this designated fund that's invested, that produces earnings uh, every year. And that money is used to pay for uh, power cost equalization. It sort of sits off to the side. Well, those two, because they're designated, they're not constitutionally dedicated, they're designated funds. Uh, the Dunleavy administration back in 2019 took the took the position that uh, they would, if they were not separately reauthorized, essentially every year uh, in in the in the vote on the reverse sweep, not kept in the CBR, not not kept as designated funds, if they weren't reauthorized by every legislature, the the those monies, the the billion dollars in the PCE and whatever is in the higher education fund. Would come back into the CBR at the end of the uh, at the end of the session, so or at the end of the fiscal year. So, the the question each year is uh, is is on the reverse sweep is essentially, do you want to keep these funds separate, keep them in a, in their designated account, um, uh, and and continue and let them continue the purpose they've had, right? Or uh, and that's and, and so vote for the reverse sweep. Um, or vote vote against the reverse sweep, vote to keep them in the designated accounts, or do you want to bring them back into the CBR, essentially undo those programs, no longer have a special pot of money that's funding the, col the college fund, no longer have a pot of money that's funding the PCE, uh, and, uh, and, and not keep them in designated accounts and bring them back into the CBR. It would increase the CBR. The money would still be there. The money, the, the, the dollars are still dollars, uh, but they're no longer sitting out in these designated funds. So right. that's that's the issue on the reverse sweep. And 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 Lyman is, I mean, one of the motivating factors for why Lyman is is coming to Jesus on the on the on the permanent fund is he's seeing the 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 potential that the PCE fund, which is you know he helped establish and he's helped protect and he's helped grow and and is is important to him. Uh, and to his legacy and to, and to the districts that he serves, uh, he's seen uh, that as increasingly coming under fire. If it comes back into the if it comes back into the CBR, the concern is the next year it's sitting in the CBR. It's it's seen to be savings and it's just spent. 
so you no longer have that set that set of designated funds out there for the uh, for the PCE. Right, and the CB and the and the sweep and the reverse sweep. I mean, it draws every basically undedicated, undesignated pot of money. The PCE and the higher education fund being the largest ones, but it's a significant amount, and it's been just par for the course over the last dozen years or so, where they just sweep it in and sweep it right back out to where it was. It was almost kind of a housekeeping thing, but it was a way because the Constitution does not allow for dedicated funds. Some have argued, including myself, and I think you, that this is kind of quasi designated or dedicated because they you know because they're basically doing the same thing they're just sweeping it in and out and the minority discovered it was a way to be able to hold some accountability for a larger spending majority yeah it was it was never a big deal as long as the cbr was you know 10 million dollars 15 million 15 billion dollars as long as the cbr was huge numbers uh, because you always had the CB or the cbr to go to it's become a big deal as the CBR has been used up uh, and is no longer sitting there as a savings account that can be drawn from to, to you know, to plug the hole on these deficits uh, as, as long as, as, as the CBR has been drained down. So now the question is, do you want to bring that, do you want to bring that money back into the, uh, into the, into the CBR and then it will be spent away. I mean, the, the con Lyman's concern is it will be spent away as, as, as the, you know, $15 billion that's been in the CBR that was in the CBR at the beginning of the, of the last decade as, as that was spent away. So um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a big issue to him. And I think is a, is a motivating factor uh, in why he's uh, come over to the governor's side on, uh, on SJR six. But in any event, the, the question, the entire question on the budget is, is getting to 21 plus 11 and plus what do you do about the CBR? Right. Do you, do you, just go with the uh, with the leftover uh, uh, from from the current budget. Do you add in? Do you drain the CBR? Essentially, drain the CBR to add to the to the PFD. Does that get you to 21 plus 11 plus the plus the CBR, the reverse sweep, or do you have to bring in part of the ERA to get that 21 plus 11? The one thing, Michael, that that just I I, I am just perplexed by, and and I and and it may show the power of special interests in this state. The, the the one other component of money you could use to help here is the American Recovery Plan right. uh, funds, the right. ARP funds. Um, they could be used to, to backfill uh, uh, UGF spending and create essentially an additional leftover. So every dollar you put from the ARP into to, to backfill UGF spending would pop out another leftover dollar – that you could use toward the toward the 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 PFD. For example, if you took 250 million dollars out of the ARP funds, 300, 400, 500 million dollars out of the ARP funds, put it in, use it to backfill UGF, you'd pop out that amount of money to to add to the add to the PFD. They're not doing that to any significant extent. They're not doing that, and the reason is, I as as best I can figure out, is because. They've got other uses they want to make of the ARP funds. They want to, you know, they want to use a, a certain amount for um, uh, to, to 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 backfill uh, 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 aid going to uh, local governments. They want to use a certain amount for uh, a, uh, a, a, a a capital budget, and so and so it seems that that ARP money, which was which was made available by the federal government precisely to use to fill in holes in your regular budget, enti entirely permitted to be used to fill in roles in, in holes in your regular budget, which is what backfilling it into the UGF would do. Um, it seems that the, that the legislature has decided that they've got all these other shiny new projects or, or different projects they want to put that money to instead of using it to backfill. And right. that's, that, that just astounds me because – we wouldn't be having as much of a debate about the budget as we are if we use those ARP monies to backfill, but they're, they're not doing it. Now, they're supposed to have uh, some uh, – uh, Stedman was quoted earlier on as saying that maybe they'll have something by Memorial Day, and now for sure, he says, by uh, by June 1st and, and everything else. But there's no real way of knowing because they're just getting down into it now. It took a couple days to get all the paperwork together. They're supposed to meet today for the first day. 
What do you see happening based especially on the makeup of the uh, makeup on the of the conference committee, which of course is Bishop and Stedman uh, from the Senate, as well as Donnie Olson, and then Foster and Kelly Merrick and Steve Thompson on the House side. None of these people are what you would consider to be pro statutory PFD people. I mean, none of these people really are fans of the PFD. Yeah, I, and that's and that's troublesome. But it's not really about the conference committee. It's really about what 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 it takes to get to twenty one plus eleven plus the CBR. And and I think I think the the real issue here is going to be about ultimately is going to be about the CBR. Or do, or, uh, is ultimately going to be about the the CBR. Do you do, do you have to give people do, do you have to give people like Kevin McCabe more in terms of the PFD to get them to vote for the, to get them to vote uh, on the reverse sweep uh, to, to bring, to, to keep the bunnies designated. Do you have to give them more in the PFD in order to do that? And that's, that's where the action is. It, yeah, the conference committee itself is horrible and, and, but, but they don't want the conference committee doesn't want to vote out a bill and have it rejected right. in the bodies or not have the CBR sweep. Right. And we'll see, what uh, some of the folks in the chat room here have to say, Dunleavy should request the legislature pay the extra $7,000 plus PFD interest like Sarah did. And if they reject it, the voters will remember that. Well, I mean, again, that's the thing. There's no political will to do. There's not even a political will to pay a statutory PFD, let alone the leftover. I would agree with you, Robert. But again, there's the reality of who do you get to vote for it? And you're right. People would remember who voted for or against something. But it doesn't really do anything at this point uh, because they're they're just not going to do it. it. It's a non-starter at this point, right, Brad? Well, yeah, the conference committee won't come out with that proposal uh, because it, it'll be it'll be dead on arrival. It won't get twenty-one plus eleven. Uh, it won't get twenty-one in the House for sure. Uh, and so the conference committee is not going to come out with that proposal. The conference committee is going to sit there until they get a proposal that has twenty-one plus eleven plus deals. Uh, with the reverse sweep and that's and it's all about it's it's all about doing that so it, yeah it'd be fun to to you know put that on the record and see who voted for it uh really if you were ever going to do that the time to have done that would have been when the the appropriations bill was in one of the bodies either in the house or or in the senate and put that forward as an amendment and to see who voted for it but now that we're into conference committee it's no longer a realistic uh alternative <laughs> I got to love Randy. Um, I'm a big fan of an honest PFD, he says. That is a dividend that is supported by surplus money after the bills are paid. But here's my experience, and Brad, you can comment on this. The legislature is going to spend all the money that's available that they can get their hands on, period. So the idea that somehow there'll be surplus money when a politician is involved, historically, I think the track record proves there will be none. And whether that's at the national level, whether that's at the uh, state level, whether that's at the local level. Uh, I mean, the only reason the state and the and the local levels don't overspend what they have is because they can't print more money. Politi there will be no surplus money when politicians are involved. They will as they will suck up. Look at what happened to the CBR. They will take every available dollar and build programs around it. It's not going to get any better. You can't wait for them to be fiscally responsible. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right, Michael. And we're seeing we're seeing it not only in the regular budget, but we're seeing it in the ARP. I mean, the ARP to me is a fascinating study. It is funds that could be used to backfill into the regular budget, spend, you know, help offset the the, the revenue deficits we've had, uh, and and create this surplus that uh, that Randy would would like us to rely on. The ARP is exactly what you what could be used exactly to do that, and yet they're not doing it. They're spending it on other new shiny toys uh, uh, to uh, uh, to to you know to full fulfill uh, the the requests of of special interests and special constituencies. Well, so yeah, we're we're I mean we've that we've seen the history of the of of this leftover PFD decline from 2016 from you know, 2016 to today now we're down to five hundred dollars it, it would be gone next year if we continue on that we see it in terms of the arp they're not using that money to backfill they're using it to spend on other things it's a it's a cute 
uh, uh, interpretation uh, on Randy's part, but it's not realistic. Well, and again, even people like Dunleavy, the second that that ARP money come out, it seemed like most of the money was going to be spent on new projects, new, you know, pie in the sky, new. I think his plan only called for $135 million of it to be used to offset UGF spending. Uh, I mean, it's insane. You've got a billion dollars here that's supposed to be supporting and benefiting the people directly in the form of relief, and instead you're spending it on new stuff. That proves my point right there. Yeah, exactly. It, the ARP is just I, – I, I, I don't know what we're doing. I mean, I honestly don't know what we're doing. Uh, it was it was intended to backfill. It was intended to and, and could have been used to backfill and pop out more. Uh, uh, leftover money, if that's if that's the approach we're going to go, and yet we're not doing it. Final thoughts on where you think we end up here uh, as we go through this week. They say they want to be done by Memorial Day weekend. I don't know if it's going to happen, but where do you see this coming out at based on the players and based on what you're hearing down in Juneau right now? I think it comes out on, on the reverse sweep. The question is whether The question is whether they get to 2111, but they don't have enough for the reverse sweep, and they decide to go with that. Or whether the whether the reverse sweep is really important to them, preserving the reverse sweep is really important to them. Uh, in which event they're going to have to give more to the House minority. Really, is where this is going to grind out uh, more to the House minority in terms of PFD to get the House minority to come across uh, on the reverse sweep, and that's going to put a lot of power in the hands of the of the House minority if. You know, they, they decide that they need the reverse sweep as, as part of this. So it, if, if they do, then the House min- minority has leverage to increase the amount of the PFD. If they decide that they're not going to go with the reverse sweep, that they're just going to let it go, then the House minority decreases in leverage and the PFD becomes smaller. That's that, And, and, and that's going to take a while to grind out. It's not going to be done by Memorial Day. It's going to take two or three weeks. We're going to have all sorts of conniptions about, oh my God, we're going to have layoffs on July one. Uh, but but that's where it's going to that's where it's going to grind out. It's going to grind out in whether the House minority uses its leverage on the reverse sweep to increase the PFD, or uh, the majority decides to uh, to go without it. Brad Keithley is our guest. We're moving from number one to number two, which is. What it'll take to pass SGR six? What's it really going to take? And and do they kick it off to the August special session? Do they include the discussions in this piece? And that's where kind of the reverse sweep comes in because that is the lever, the leverage that they use to try and get it passed, to try and get some support for SGR six. If they divorce it from the reverse sweep, then any kind of leverage that the minority would have to try and and garner those votes is pretty much gone. Yeah, I think that's right, Michael. I, I think that's a I think that's a good analysis. Um, I think there's very little likelihood that that we resolve the constitutional amendments in the first special session, notwithstanding the fact that it's that it's in the governor's call. I think I think we're going to use up all the oxygen in the room figuring out what we're going to do on the budget, uh, finding the, the the votes necessary, uh, and dealing with the reverse sweep in a way that. Uh, that resolves what we're going to do on the budget. I think there's going to be very little oxygen left in the room to, to, to get, to deal with the bigger picture. Unless, unless the reverse sweep is so critically important to the majority and getting the reverse sweep done is so critically important to the majority that, that the minority has the leverage to say, look, we got to solve this all at once. We got to solve it all now before we'll ever give you our reverse sweep votes. If, if right. that's, if that's what they do, then yeah, there's I guess there's a chance to drag in the the SJRs also, but that's going to make that, that's that's really going to push you to the to the to the July one. Uh, well, it's really it's going to it's going to it's going to consume all of this special session. Uh, and may require an additional special session to uh, to even get a even get a budget done if we're going to try to do it all at once. So what is it going to take to get SJR six and maybe some of its cousins passed in this point? So it's 2714. <laughs> this is all numbers, right? It's it's 27 in the House and 14 in the Senate, uh, and and it's what it takes to uh, uh, to push it across uh, across those markers. And basically, it's all about it's all about revenues. It's all about how are you going to balance the budget long term? Getting 27 plus 14 to agree, how you're going to balance the budget long term? 
uh, after you do after you do the constitutional amendment, after you constitutionalize the the, the PFD. For example, Natasha would agree to constitutionalize the PFD if it's set at a $500 PFD. I mean, that's what her SJR 18 does. And she would come and she would agree to a constitutional amendment if the if you're constitutionalizing uh, only a $500 PFD and you're using the remainder uh, to balance the budget. Uh, Dunleavy, on the other hand, says that he will that he wants to constitutionalize a PFD essentially by kicking the, the can down the road to future generations using three a three billion dollar withdrawal from the um, from the the ERA as a bridge so you don't have to face this issue for another you know two or three years uh, and uh, then you know setting up uh, 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 deep uh, spending cuts in order to continue to achieve a balanced budget uh, after after you know those two or three years that you've had as an ERA bridge. I don't think either of those extremes. Natasha's uh, uh, $500 PFD use the rest for spending, uh, or the governor's uh, give me three billion dollars out of the ERA to act as a bridge, and then we're going to have to make deep spending cuts beyond that. I don't think either of those alternatives. Uh, come to 27 plus 11. So I, I don't think I don't think e either either way uh, the, uh, of those two extremes that we're that we're going to get there. The 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 middle path, um, a middle path is okay. We agree to a certain PFD. We recognize it's going to create deficits going forward, and this is how we're going to agree to fill those deficits uh, going forward. We're going to agree now how we're going to fill those deficits going forward, um, and and maybe use a little bit out of the ERA as a bridge before we kick in those additional revenue measures. Kathy Tilton yesterday in the, in the Juno Empire article, I think in the same Juno Empire article you were referencing, said the minority might, or some in the minority might be agreeable to sales taxes, to using sales taxes as a revenue measure. And if you've got if you've got a, a PFD that 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 we established the PFD. You know you're going to have deficits going forward, and now we've got an agreement on sales taxes to to fill in those to fill in those holes going forward. You you get closer to 27 plus 11. Right. You get people people on the house side who are who are more prone to agree to the PFD because they know what the what the revenues are going to be on the other side of this. So it's it's a it's a it's a balance. It's finding that balance between uh, to get enough to 27 plus 11. That constitutionalizes the PFD at a certain at a certain amount, and addresses the revenue uh, problem in some fashion, uh, going beyond that. And this is one of the reasons why Shower put out that whole slide deck showing the various options utilizing sales taxes based on the right. uh, South Dakota and Wyoming model, because he could show you that yeah, with just a very small sales tax and some maybe some oil taxation. And uh, the and the finagling of SJR six, you could be at a balanced budget in between two and six years, uh, and be all squared away. So that takes care of that additional revenue component that everybody's complaining about, uh, and it might be a way forward. It might be. I mean, it's it's again. Can you get to twenty seven plus eleven? One of the one of the oddities or ironies or or problems to me with with that with with what Kathy said with what Tilton said and with what Shower's doing is relying on sales taxes sales taxes are regressive also so you're replacing one regressive tax PFD cuts with another regressive tax sales taxes what 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 have you gained uh, in 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 doing all that but that's sort that's a minor issue how how we hash out what those revenues are is sort of the minor issue the the the, the real big issue is can we get people to agree on setting aside a certain portion every year for the PFD by constitutionalizing it? And can we get people to agree on how we're going to fill that revenue gap after that? Well, Brad never brings us a lot of hope, unfortunately. Oh, you just, you, you pain me, Brad, you pain me. Um, I, no, there's, I, it's, it's just the difficulty in getting to hope. How about that? I know. It's like I could see hope from here, and then Brad brings a tire iron out and just beats me down before I get to it. Um, all right. Uh, well, let's uh, let's talk about any final thoughts on number two before we move quickly on to number three here. we got about four and a half minutes here before we run out of daylight. No, well, it's – I mean, I think you hit – I think you hit on a key – 
uh, uh, back during the discussion, which is, will the minority use their power over the reverse sweep in a way to, uh, in a way not only to affect the budget, but uh, attempt to affect uh, the, the the forward movement forward movement on the PFD, and that's sort of balance. In, and let's say they do. Let's say that there's that there's more than 16 that are willing to use their 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 refusal to go forward on the reverse sweep. Uh, to uh, or it's, it's more than 16. It's whatever the number is. There, there's more than enough to use their refusal to go forward on the reverse sweep, uh, and and so they will. You know, they'll say, look, we got to solve everything before we give you our vote on the reverse sweep. Then the question is, do the, does the majority run out of patience and say, out oh, of hell with the reverse sweep? We're just going to go with 2111 on the budget and forget forget the uh, forget the uh, uh, constitutional amendment. That's the balance. So. You know, the minority plays a huge role here because of the vote necessary on the reverse sweep. The minority potentially plays a huge plays a huge role here. How they use it is is uh, is a tremendously important issue. And and do they mm. can they figure out how to play it in a way to not overplay their hand and have the majority just reject it? Uh, can they figure out a, a, a path forward out of that? So that's right. That's really going to be sort of the fascinating issue here. Well, and the question is, can the minority hold together? I mean, we keep hearing about, oh, we've got the solid twenty. Oh no, we got the solid nineteen. Oh no, we got the solid seventeen. Oh no, we got the. I mean, we've seen you know Lebon and Thompson have been peeled off now. Of course, Rasmussen and Merrick were peeled off. Uh, I mean, it only takes seventeen between. I think sixteen or seventeen between both bodies. Eleven in the House and six in the Senate to be able to hold up a reverse sweep. And so do we have that solid, this is the line in the sand and we won't blink at all in both sides of the House? I think we probably do in the House side. In the Senate, do we have the six or seven needed there? That's a bigger question. Will they hold the line? Because they could. If they held the line, that's where we're going to get it done. But they've got to be willing to do that and take the brunt of the heat as it comes through. And and hope and 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 push it right to the point, but not beyond the point where the majority says it isn't worth it anymore. We're just going to give up on the reverse sweep, and we're going to we're going to go forward. Right. So it's a it's a it's a very it's a very delicate balancing act that we're, yeah. that we're asking out of the minority here. All right. Well, tonight at five p.m. we've got uh, the big panel discussion on we are unrepresented. Uh, you've uh, people been getting good response from the movie so far. Have you been watching uh, what's happening? We have. Uh, we've been getting a lot of good response. We've got a lot of people who signed up to uh, to have watched the movie, who have who have clicked on the link and 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 watched the movie so far, and hopefully we're going to have a, a good response uh, tonight. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, uh, there's one quote early on in the movie that I think sort of defines it all. Um, it says the 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 one of the speakers is saying members of Congress aren't corrupt for the most part, but the system is corrupt. The system is what's driving uh, the deficit. It's what's driving the partisanship. It's what's driving uh, the difficulty of Congress to get to, to get to solutions. And the movie, in in an hour, it only takes an hour, and you can break it up. You can watch a little bit and then watch a little bit more. Uh, the movie zeroes in on why the system is corrupt. What's corrupt about the system? That's that's driving this partisanship. That's driving the 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 national debt to to astronomic levels, um, and and the movie's great at doing that. And I think the 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 discussion tonight on the panel, uh, hopefully, is going to focus, and I expect will focus on on why that system is corrupt and what can be done, both at the national and at the state level, because this is a problem uh, at both at both levels. What can be done to repair the system, to fix the system? In a way that it no longer produces these uh, these corrupt results. And if you if you if you want to understand Congress, if you want to understand the national debt, if you want to understand why why we've got a broken system, please watch the movie, um, and please listen to the uh, to the to the uh, to the to the panel. Uh, we're going to record the panel. It's going to be available for later viewing. So if you can't make it at five o'clock, that's fine. Uh, the pa- we'll we'll have recorded the panel discussion and we'll have it up you know, in, in perpetuity after that. So you can catch up uh, with it later. But this is the reason I'm so high on this movie is this does a wonderful job in, in bringing the issue to the center and, and, and helping you understand what's the core issue of what's caused our broken system uh, and how, and how we can fix it going forward. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Brad, thanks for coming in and, uh, 
being part of it. I uh, appreciate it. As always, the beatdown will continue until morale improves. That's kind of how we're at right now. That's... <laughs> Michael, as always, thanks for putting up with me. Maybe uh, I should put it that way. I know exactly. No, it's good stuff, Brad. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll talk with you again soon. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.